You join me in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week when we were talking about being an inviting church, we observed that every time we welcome someone into our fellowship, it changes us. Every new person brings a new perspective shaped by a unique set of life experiences. Being an inviting church commits us to being a dynamic, not static community. It means that we are willing to open ourselves to being changed by the people that we welcome into our fellowship. So for the last two weeks of this worship series, I want to focus our attention on how we want to respond to the inevitable changes that come with being an inviting church. Today and next week, we'll look more deeply at our strategic priority to embody difference faithfully. Experts tell us that embodying difference faithfully is not an effective strategy for church growth. The easiest way to grow a church is to tailor everything to reach one specific segment of the population. Find out what kind of music they listen to and incorporate that style of music into your worship. Find out what kind of issues they are dealing with every day and tailor your message and your programs to address the felt needs of the target audience. The easiest way to grow a church is to follow the same path as growing a business. Find out what your customers value and give it to them. Bill Hybels did that extremely well when he started the Willow Creek congregation in suburban Chicago to reach young, professional, baby boomer families that were moving into the Chicagoland neighborhood in the early 1980s. Rick Warren, founder of the Saddleback Church, did the same thing in Lake Forest, California. They chose one target audience and grew their churches by addressing the needs and the preferences of that one narrow segment of the population. Churches that embrace uniformity are churches that are prone to growth. But that's not our understanding of the gospel. We believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ compels us to be in fellowship with people who are different than us. Unlike our Jewish forebearers who were often cautioned against having contact with Gentiles, we followers of Jesus have always been encouraged to go out into all the world and make disciples among the nations. The history of the early church is filled with stories of the followers of Jesus transgressing barriers of gender and race and nationality and ethnicity and religion. Our founding story, the story of Pentecost, is not a story about everyone hearing one voice speaking about God in the authorized King James Version. 
The story of Pentecost is the story of devout people of all tongues and races, each hearing in their own native tongues the mighty deeds of God. Christianity grew from a small cult within Judaism to a global movement because of its commitment to transgress boundaries that separate people from each other. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, died while preaching to former slaves. Philip, Peter, and John reached out to the despised Samaritan community and invited them into fellowship. In Gaza, Philip baptized an Ethiopian eunuch. In Damascus, a disciple named Ananias ministered to a violent Pharisee named Saul who had been struck blind while persecuting the followers of Jesus. Tabitha, also known by her Greek name Dorcas, became a leader of the Christian community in Joppa. Lydia led a women's prayer group in Philippi. Barnabas reached out to the Hellenists in Antioch, and the community grew so quickly that he sent word to Tarsus to summon a man named Saul to come and help. A Greek man named Timothy was baptized into the Christian fellowship and went on to accompany Paul on his missionary journeys to share the good news with Gentile communities all along the Mediterranean throughout what is now Turkey and Greece. They, Emily Joy, shared part of the story of the amazing encounter between Peter and a man named Cornelius. Perhaps more than any other scripture, that story is foundational to our commitment to embody difference faithfully. Cornelius and Peter were about as different as two people could be. There was no good reason for them to know each other. No good reason for them to care about each other. No good reason for them to be in relationship with each other. Cornelius was a Roman centurion, a member of the occupation army, stationed with the garrison in Caesarea to enforce the Pax Romana. His job was to ensure local compliance with the edicts of Rome, to make sure that everyone was paying the full measure of the taxes imposed on them by Rome to crush any dissent, to squash any hint of insurrection. Cornelius was not the friendly local constable. He was a foreigner from a different country, a different culture, a different religion stationed in Caesarea to remind the local residents that they were a conquered and subjugated people. Peter was a native Jew, a follower of Jesus who had not severed his tie to the religious traditions of his ancestors. He still observed the laws of Moses, still kept kosher, still honored the Sabbath, still engaged in ritual washings to purify himself after exposure to anything considered unclean. Cornelius and Peter never, ever would have chosen to be in relationship with each other. But God was able to bring them together because they were both men of prayer. 
They didn't call God by the same name. But they both sought to live their lives in ways that were pleasing to God. Every day they spent time practicing the spiritual disciplines of their respective traditions. And prayer is a dangerous thing. Prayer changes us. Every time we open our hearts and minds to God, our lives become more expansive. Prayer opens us to new possibilities for God's grace and God's mercy and God's love to move in our lives. Because they were both listening for a word from God. They were receptive to God's invitation to live in new ways. Cornelius, already a devout man, became curious about this new religion he was hearing about. And one day had a vision in which an angel of God instructed him to summon Peter from Joppa to come and teach him more about Jesus. Cornelius wasn't threatened by a religion that was different from his own. He didn't try to stifle it. He didn't repress it. He didn't discredit it. He was curious to learn more about it. Peter, who was a faithful Jew, normally wouldn't have met in private with a Gentile like Cornelius, but during that same period, Peter had been having his own spiritual awakening. Angels had been troubling his sleep with visions that contradicted some of his most deeply held convictions. As a Jew, Peter had always divided the world into things that were clean and things that were unclean, things sacred and things profane, things pure and things defiled. It was a distinction that permeated every aspect of Peter's life, the foods that he ate, the fabric that he wore, the people that he interacted with. Maintaining the distinction between clean and unclean helped Peter live in ways that he believed were pleasing to God, but recently he'd begun to question that distinction. His sleep had been haunted by a recurring dream about a huge sheet being lowered from heaven, filled with All kinds of different animals, some clean and some unclean. Each time he heard a voice telling him to kill and eat, and each time Peter resisted eating foods that he had always considered unclean, but each time he heard the angel's voice saying, what God has made clean, you must not call profane, and then suddenly three unclean Gentiles were knocking at his door with a remarkable story about Cornelius and his desire to meet people, to meet Peter and hear more about Jesus. So Peter decided to do what he had never done before. He went with them. And he entered the house of the Gentile Cornelius. And there he was invited to give his testimony and to share everything he knew about the life and the ministry of Jesus. And much to his astonishment, Cornelius and his entire household were receptive 
to the good news that he shared, everyone was deeply moved by the Holy Spirit through that encounter. And Peter was inspired to proclaim something he had never said before. I truly understand now that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, everyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. Peter baptized everyone in Cornelius' household and remained with them several more days before returning to Joppa. More than anything else, the conviction that God shows no partiality is what transformed Christianity from a small Jewish cult into a global movement that engages people of all ages, tongues, and races. At the heart of this congregation's priority to embody difference faithfully is the realization that every human encounter holds the potential for bringing us closer to God through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. That's what moves us beyond tolerance. That's what moves us beyond accommodation. That's what moves us to cherish and to embrace the richness of human diversity as a precious gift from God. This Fourth of July weekend, we heard the voices of Jefferson and Adams and Franklin and other founding fathers invoked for their courageous efforts to shape the declaration of our nation's independence. No other document has had a greater impact on the history of our great nation. It's fitting and it's right that the anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence should be marked with great displays of patriotism and national pride. Flags waving, fireworks exploding, families and friends celebrating with profound joy and thanksgiving. But there are other voices that need to be heard as well. Seventy-six years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, when Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, was asked to address the Ladies' Anti-Slavery Society on July 5th, 1852, in his native city of Rochester, New York, Douglass delivered his famous speech entitled, The Meaning of July 4th for the Negro. His speech had a very different tone than the speeches of patriotic fervor that people were accustomed to hearing. Included in Douglas's speech were these pain-filled words. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all the other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. 
your boasted liberty an unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes that would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States this very hour. For African Americans whose liberty was not secured, with the declaration signed on July 4th, 1776, Juneteenth is the celebration that commemorates their movement into freedom. Their liberty began not with the signing of the Declaration of Independence, but with the Emancipation Proclamation issued by President Lincoln on September 22nd, 1862. But that news spread slowly in the South. It wasn't until June 19th, 1865, that the Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston to occupy Texas on behalf of the federal government and read aloud the contents of General Order Number 3, announcing the total emancipation of slaves. Embodying difference faithfully requires our willingness to listen to voices that are not like our own. To honor all of our different experiences. To respect all of our different perspectives. To respond to all of our different life circumstances. Peter and Cornelius, Lincoln and Douglas, Johnson and King, Nikki Haley, Clementa Pickney. They're all people who would never have chosen to be in relationship with each other. But God made it happen. God is constantly working to transgress the boundaries that alienate us from each other. Our commitment to embody difference faithfully requires that we open ourselves to the transforming power of prayer. 
that we allow God's Holy Spirit to make us more expansive, more open, more engaging of people who don't look like us, don't sound like us, don't act like us. The greatness of our Christian tradition rests on the realization that God shows no partiality. Amen.